Hello everyone and welcome to the latest episode of Sug Talks, which we're actually recording at the 2023 UK Sug Connect conference uh, in person and live. I'm Craig Dale, your host, and together with our special guests, we'll take a deep dive into the opportunities, challenges and topics facing SAP users today. Please make sure you hit that subscribe button so you never miss another episode. I'm delighted today to be joined by Simon Nichols, CEO and founder at Thrive, and also Mike Jeffries, training manager at Birmingham Mine. So welcome, gentlemen. Thank you for having Thank us. Thank you. And in today's episode, we're going to be discussing the support provided by the Mine charity and some tips from both Simon and Mike when it comes to mental health. Just before we get into that, gentlemen, I just thought I'd ask you, what is your favourite Christmas food? Why are you having to think about that? I mean, I, I do love a turkey dinner and all the trimmings, uh, which is generally everything to excess. Uh, but, yeah, I'm going to stick with that, because if I try to cast my mind on anything, nothing else really sticks out. So I'm going for the full turkey dinner with the trimmings. Simon? I went into a well-known coffee shop, not Starbucks, because I know we're not allowed to uh, advertise any on, on these podcasts, but it's the other one, uh, beginning with C. And I was perusing the cakes, because I'm a big cake fan, you can tell that just by looking at me. And I, in amongst everything else, they just released the Christmas Slice. Ooh. And I just thought, is, is it going to take me back to... Christmas is of old where the your mum spent 15 weeks injecting sherry into a, a, a Christmas cake and I'd like to say yes but it didn't oh, yeah. it didn't it didn't take me back to that uh, to that Christmas moment but I think my, my, my fondest memories um, are of that of that traditional Christmas cake fruit sherry nice big slice of it traditionally with brandy butter, but I hate that. So I used to have it with ice cream. Oh, okay, with ice cream. Well, I, I was going to ask if you if you liked it with a, with a slice of cheese. I love mine with a nice slice of mature cheddar. We had this conversation on a previous podcast, didn't we? If you mix savoury and sweet, it's <laughs> it just says more about you than it does about me. I do apologise. We'll move swiftly on. Mike? <laughs> How to follow that? How to follow that? Um, I'm going to go pigs in blankets, I think. Um, I, I think growing up, they always seemed they always seemed a bit posh, to be honest. They always seemed a little bit kind of... Um, they weren't your traditional fare. They were the kind of added thing that maybe says something about growing up in a Midlands town. I don't know. Possibly it does. But yeah, pigs in blankets, I think. They still, still feel something extra special about those. So yeah, my son is into those. So that's what we have to have. Oh, fantastic. Well, thanks very much for that, guys. Really appreciate it. And ju just to start things off, uh, for, for those that are not familiar with, with MIND, Mike, would you uh, be able to give us an overview of what the charity does, please? Yeah, certainly, Craig. Thank you. Um, so MIND nationally, um, uh, well, MIND full stop. Our aim is mental health for all, so it's that everyone... Actually, it's, it's only in the last couple of years, World Health Organization changed their definition of mental health, and yet they're starting to use a phrase around uh, mental health being a universal human right, that everyone has a, a right to a level of mental health. And I, I'm 56, and, and the words mental and health were so often followed by mental health disease, mental health problem, mental health illness. Yeah. Um, we're very much about mental health in a more rounded sense of actually being something that's just as important as your physical health, um, something to fight for, something to cherish, something to look after. Um, so it's supporting people in whatever way they need around that. Nationally, the charity lobbies government sometimes and can push government hard, uh, take government to task, etc. if they're not um, promoting mental health agendas, not delivering what they've promised around that. And there's a national helpline, a legal helpline as well. And then across the country, in our jargon, there's always too much jargon in everything, isn't it? In, in our jargon, we're, um, I work for an LMA, so Birmingham Mind is a local mind association. So uh, in the patches and the cities and the towns where we exist, lovely if we were in every town and city, but we're not, unfortunately. Um, we deliver lots of services. So Birmingham Mine, for instance, delivers residential care to people who need 24-7 support. Uh, we have drop-in services. We have a wonderful um, drop-in hub in the middle of the Bullring Shopping Centre in Birmingham oh, wow. City Centre at the moment, which is a wonderful partnership with the Bullring Shopping Centre itself. Uh, we have a 24-hour helpline. Uh, 
peer support services, which in the jargon are people with lived experience, mental health issues, running things themselves, telling us where we get it wrong, how we can make it better. And that, that was uh, user involvement. And lots of people hate the word user. It's got other connotations, hasn't it? But uh, people with mental health issues telling us how we could improve things and make things better is a large part of what we're about, really. And I think we're going to say more later, but on the training side, taking that into workplaces is, is the bit I'm about. So lots of different things. Um, lots of stuff with workplaces, as I say. Will, will probably come on to as well so I, I think often people can associate mind with counseling for instance mm -hmm. uh, birmingham mind doesn't offer counseling because there are other wonderful organizations in this locality that have done that for longer do that better is the truth of the matter so it's uh, these days lots of things are partnerships between different organizations so yeah it's a uh, a wide widespread and different beast on lots of levels really but yeah um the national website has a, a wonderful a to z of mental health so if you needed information around depression for instance you literally just click on the D and there's a leaflet you can download. There's lovely um, uh, sort of uh, blogs now, uh, videos uh, as well. So yeah, wide ranging what we do. <laughs> oh, fantastic. And you know, we, we're so pleased to be supporting uh, Birmingham Mind at, at, at this conference. And uh, you know, we covered the five uh, ways of well-being uh, not so long ago, Sam and I in a discussion. And you know, that, that area is quite prevalent throughout the event and what, what are some of the common reasons that people get in touch with mind again hugely varied um people's mental health and where it's at is a very individual thing very different thing for for all of us but pretty much every circumstance you could think of really um difficult relationships uh the cost of living crisis, of course, very real, um, huge impact on people in, in this area, to say the least. Uh, low levels of pay often. Um, so it can be economic issues, can be uh, issues of relationship breakdown, of loss. Um, it can be every challenge of life, really, mm -hmm. in lots of ways. That uh, We're all different. We respond to things in different ways, internalize things in different ways. Um, part of my experience through the, personally through the, the COVID uh, pandemic was I was part redeployed onto our 24-hour helpline. And I, I was particularly struck by the number of w women who were ringing up, um, often very embarrassed that they're even having to have to make the call. Uh, and saying things like, I, I, I can't break because I hold up so many other people. So many other people in family, friends are, uh, rely on me. I, I can't be the one that breaks. But what do I do? Help. Um, yeah. And that, of course, right through to people expressing suicidal thoughts and needing crisis in interventions as well. Mm -hmm. So so the whole gamut of, of, of human life in so many ways, really. Yeah, thank you. And I can, uh, from the conversations we've had, Simon, you, you work with people in similar ways as well. Yeah, and um, I mean, obviously, we we are a very small cog in a in, in a massive uh, a massive mental health support network of which mind is 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 critical and it's interesting that, that mike said earlier because we all have our perceptions or, or rather our lived experiences of, of actually working with mind and if you were to have asked me what what mind does for me and my family uh we, we were very blessed that my son was able to get some counseling uh through um uh blmk mind which is bedford luton milton Keynes. And the service that they uh, that they offered, which was unfortunately used to be three, but in you know these uh, austere times, uh, it's still cost effective. But again, it's that universal right. How do we get all of this support out to to the people that needed it? For my son, it was critical, and it actually helped him get through his GCE, uh, GCSEs. Um, it helped a diagnosis of dyslexia, and actually, he's recently gone on to get some uh, additional counselling thanks to the support he got from 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 uh, my and BLMK. And as a result of that level of counselling, he's now going to get a. Uh, uh, diagnosis of autism which has really impacted how his anxiety and his mm -hmm. mental health has been so again i mean it's a we we, we probably signpost daily to the the various different um services that mind offer um so yeah just being just being in a room with mike and 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 delivering our session this morning was uh, was incredible yeah, no, I think in you know I, th I think in recent years you know, it, we we've talked about it again in 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 the past about there's kind of people's mental health has uh, become more and more prevalent and, and mainstream and in a understandable way now and I think is viewed more of a, a positive way. Uh, have you seen uh, Mike the number of people getting in touch with mine increased in recent years or decreasing? 
Yeah, um, I mean, certainly the figures uh, appear to show more people. Um, that, that there are peaks and troughs in that. There were peaks and troughs through the COVID pandemic that it kind of went in. Uh, it's an unfortunate term in a sense, isn't it? But waves in terms of people asking for, for help and support uh, mm-hmm. at different points of that, really. Um, I think Simon makes such a well, loads of brilliant points and um, it sh- also shouldn't belittle his own effort as well because at the end of the day, people ask for, for help with people they trust and they believe in. And it's really important for me that there's lots of offers out there because yeah. mine isn't going to be the right offer for some people. Um, but every- everyone deserves help and support if they need it. So, yeah, the figures say more people. I, I guess in a sense... We're often more concerned about the people who don't show up in the figures, though, the people who don't ask for help, um, the people who the stigma's still there. We've we've challenged it, and again, I, I'll go with Simon's drop in the ocean thing. I'm a drop in the ocean in terms of the the, the efforts to challenge that. I think we've, we've made a difference, we're making a difference, but there's still lots of reasons in people's heads why it's um, it's a scary thing to do to yeah. seek help. Uh, I think particularly in workplaces still, um, mental health of all health categories tends to be the one that more people leave workplaces and any other still to this day so whilst a lot's been done there's an amazing positive things being here being here is something i don't think i've worked for mine for 20 years uh, for birmingham mine for 20 years and i can't imagine us being here 20 years ago because i think partly we wouldn't have known how to reach out we wouldn't have known Mm -hmm. how to talk to Mm -hmm. organizations such as yourself and businesses so we've learned we needed to learn a lot in those years as well so it's yes figures gone up but in a sense i'm more worried about the people who never show in the figures because they're, they're the people who still don't feel able to ask for help or or find us a form of help that they feel safe with uh, yeah. that they think might work for them mm-hmm. and and do you find that kind of the, the the greater awareness has has that changed the kind of support people look for i mean i don't see it, 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 do do you uh, see any change in that sound or what people come to talk to you about as well yeah and um, and it's, it's it's an interesting question because when you think about the range of support and, and what Mike said earlier, you know, 20 years ago, um, not only were obviously you and I, Craig, were a lot um, lot younger and and and, uh, and 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 fitter. You've still kept the fitness. I am very jealous. I was but, young once. Ah, yeah. And um, but we're still we're still attractive, so that's all good. Um, but the. You know, we would not have had these conversations. We would not have even broached the conversation of talking very openly uh, about our mental health. And, and what's fantastic about the uh, the, the Connect uh, conference this year is uh, we were you, you very kindly gifted us a couple of sofas. Not, I can't take them home, unfortunately. But um, we, I've already had three conversations this morning of people opening up and talking about their struggles and the impacts that, that are going on for them. And it's just that when when you say different levels of support, I think people are desperate at the moment to do to find something, something that works for them. Mm-hmm. And um, I, again, and I don't know if Mike, you've had a few people coming up from our session this morning, and it's, oh, that's great, thank you, I'm gonna take that away, I'm gonna do something about that. And I think all we really offer is just, it, what works for you? Because we talk about the five ways of well-being, and you know, realistically, you're not going to take all five, and you're going to go away and 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 you know, cut your day down into twenty percent segments. But you might just take one of them away, and I think that's it. And I think mental resilience, and I don't know if Mike will, will agree with me on this, but mental resilience is becoming much more at the forefront, and we're seeing a lot more training being asked for in that space because. If you're empowering people to be resilient, and we talked about happiness at the end of our session, you're you're actually giving or gifting people that ability to support themselves. And I think that's what's been missing for a long while is that everybody else believes, certainly in the workplace, that someone else is responsible for them yeah. and responsible for their happiness. And I think what we're doing is, again, just making each day a little bit more responsive for those people to help themselves. And I think that's mm-hmm. how that's what's changing. Mike, mm-hmm. would you agree with that? Yeah, I would. I would. And um, again, it's so individual what people want, what what people need. And people are often um, kind of scrabbling to figure out what they think they need in lots of ways, really. But yeah, I think it's changed a lot in terms of uh, the, the, the part I do, that the taking training into workplaces, for instance, is that's diversified a lot. A lot more line manager training, a lot more kind of... Um, it's that um, I, I thought it was a kind of bygone phrase that had kind of died out. Really, the, the phrase "I didn't leave, I didn't leave the workplace, I left the manager." Um, I'm 
hearing that that phrase come back in lots mm-hmm. of ways, really. So it's that um, you know, managers key cogs in the wheel in, in workplaces in terms of supporting people's mental well-being. And it's a good question: who supports their well-being as well? Um, you can say they're the key cogs, but who looks after them? Who do they get to talk to? Who do they get to sound off to, etc.? So a lot more demand for that kind of thing. Um, webinars as well, uh, all kinds of things. An amazing uh, webinar with a housing organisation um, last year, the year before, um, around World Suicide Prevention Day, and, and they'd they'd got to this point where they'd um, done a lot of work around mental health and well-being. Um, they had a number of employees who were confident to talk about their experiences now, uh, uh, blogs and videos on the, the, the Yammer, the intranet system for the company. Uh, two people who'd made attempts on their own life who prepared to talk about that, prepared to talk about warning signs. Uh, I effectively just interviewed the pair of them. I, I had the easy bit. Uh, you know, they, they had the expertise and that they talked about their experiences. But amazing for a company to get to that point, to think this is a valid thing, this is a, a thing of benefit, this is a thing that actually has, has that impact on productivity as well. Um, if people are bought in, they p- feel looked after, then of course we give more of ourselves, we're more creative. Uh, our best ideas come when we feel like we're looked after. Someone cares for us as well. So, yeah, yeah, I think it, it, it's changed a lot, um, but there's still that real kind of breadth of need, to say mm-hmm. the least. There are still plenty of people for whom this is all brand new and very scary territory, and it mm-hmm. goes against everything they've kind of been brought up to believe, to it, in a sense, because certainly I was, and I don't blame my parents for this, I kind of take you know, Simon's point about we all got our own responsibility for our health, but kind of grew up thinking, well, no, this is not what men do in particular. Um, yeah. And I think there's still a lot of that, a lot of that around, to say the least, yeah. We know our community, but we don't know yours yet. Why not share the benefits of your UKI SUG membership with those who don't know about us? The UKI SUG referral scheme rewards you for helping to grow and develop our community. You can check out the link in the description to find out more about how you can get involved. Terms and conditions apply. We hope you enjoy the rest of the podcast. Simon mentioned training as well in uh, Mind Birmingham. What, what do you do training and what kind of training do you do? Yeah, we do, and, and that's the, the part I'm specifically responsible for. So, um, actually, myself and Simon are both a mental health first aid instructors. So that that type of training we deliver to all kinds of organisations, you know, corporate, smaller organisations, etc. Um, different types of that training as well. You can uh, you refresh that training every three years. There are awareness versions of that training. Uh, I mentioned line manager training as well. I was jumping mm-hmm. ahead there, wasn't I? Um, the, the line manager training is is something that people are more and more asking for um mindfulness uh people ask about mindfulness we have packages around that um and then look quite a lot of short sessions you kind of um you, you, you kind of meet and learn kind of lunchtime sessions people want more and more of as well and and sometimes uh, we did a session last year with it with a company um and, and they they decided to title it and it was very much around winter and impact on people's mental health and well-being seasonal affective disorder that kind of thing but but they i was i thought it was a brilliant title they went for the title is the festive season good for your head which i thought was a, a lovely lovely way of putting it it's such a you know it's it's billed as a as a really wonderful time and, and a time of happiness and joy and all of that and it, and it really isn't uh, for lots of people um but being built up to feel that it ought to be uh, has an impact on on people's mental health. So um, so yeah, a wide variety of things, um, and and it's massively increased. Um, seven eight years ago, I delivered all of it. Uh, we're at point now where we work with it's a dozen or more freelance trainers to deliver everything we do. My mental well being would not cope with trying to deliver all the training we're asked to do anymore. <laughs> so <laughs> so it's a well being thing for me as much as anything else. Yeah, <laughs> and, and and what. Is- Kind of some tips you could share, perhaps, for organisations looking to put in place mental health training. Uh, Simon, you you obviously do this as well, so yeah, you. yeah. It's, what's really interesting now is uh, is uh, the the various uh, lots of organisations uh, deliver the mental health first aid uh, training, but um, we never we never see ourselves as competition. We always see yeah. ourselves as uh, a collaborative environment because mm-hmm. it doesn't matter if you're training one or a thousand people. It's um, it's that one person, isn't it, that's uh, that's taken away. So yeah, and, and I quite often signpost people because because some people want to to have that charitable donation element in as well, and uh, you know some organisations are very commercial. So, but yeah, for me. The the tips and hints that uh, that, that that I've 
sort of started to um, to deliver a little bit more about of of really sort of focused around the five ways of well being and before it used to be it was it was a one page element in the mental health first aid uh, course there's there's one there's ten ten ways to happier living Michael know all about this and there's the five ways to well being but it was always just a sort of you, you, I'd gloss over it because it was it was towards the end of the course and uh, but actually what it's done is I've and I said this to Mike this morning it's Without knowing it, it was it's really become instrumental in my coping strategies. It really became instrumental in my recovery from depression. And you but you don't realise it until you start to break it down. So my biggest hints and tips is is at some stage log on to, to the mind website and, and you know download the five ways to, uh, to to well-being and just start to see how they impact on your life, the learn, the connect, the be active, the give. And and especially as uh, we said it earlier, my, my favorites take notice and just just be part of your life because we often we view it as a sitcom, you know, or or, or a comedy drama or in some stage a, a tragedy drama you know we, we 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 often view our lives as this event that's going on without us in it and i think what we need to do is we need to take notice of what we're doing how impactful we are to other people because that's the horrible thing with 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 what mike and i do is we sometimes hear these stories around individuals who may want to end their own life and how they're they feel that they've got nothing to give, and yet you ask their friends, their family, and the, the world would would not be the same place without them in it. And so I think you know my biggest tip is just be be in your life, and if your life isn't where you need it to be, reach out for support so that you can be in your life because I think that's the biggest thing you need to be part of who you are. Thank you, and um, Mike, anything? I don't know. Yeah, I, I, Simon said the nail on the head, I think. Um, I think our top tips are really for businesses, companies in particular, to, to hear that, take that seriously, and, and to give some leadership on it as well, to see it as a fundamental part of what makes a business successful is the health of your people, uh, and that including your leaders, of course, as well, really. So so if there's leadership for it, if the... Uh, I mean, training's a catalyst at the end of the day, isn't it? It, it can't change things. Companies, organisations need to grab it and make it their own and make it fit their their, their context, particularly a national course like, like Mental Health First Aid. But without the leadership, without that, that confidence that uh, this is a company that believes in this, sees this, and that actually, uh, well, it isn't it isn't the major motivator for me? A powerful mo a motivator is the bottom line profit, and, and ultimately, a healthier business is going to be more successful. Deloitte's report, uh, March 2022, talked about every pound you invest up front in mental health and well-being approaches, companies tend to make back around about five pound thirty. And we had the jest this morning about where's the thirty p come come from. It sounds very exact, doesn't it? But um, but <laughs> my my head can't work that bit out. But the validity of that that it, it means something, it brings something back, it has impacts on sickness levels, presenteeism, that word that we talk about when people are either physically or mentally, and often both, not well enough to, probably shouldn't be in work, but certainly shouldn't be thinking they can deliver A game or top quality work, because we're not well enough to do that. So if that's taken seriously, that, that becomes the lifeblood, if you like, one of the key strands of any business, then you're, gonna be more, you're also going to be more attractive for people to come and work for you as well. It becomes a retention thing, mm -hmm. doing the stuff around mental health so it's um and and i suppose we'd say to businesses get some of the kudos for it get get some congratulation get some success for putting your money where your mouth is and and, and really really making these things happen because uh, it will it will give you huge benefits thank you and just turning that back to kind of a personal basis from uh you know what what would be you know maybe if you had one piece of advice to give if you like to somebody who's struggling uh with, with their mental health you know what what would that be i think it's what we, we said for a long time and, it, and it's still right that it's um you're allowed not to be okay um that it's it's a part of the human condition it's part of human life um give yourself that permission um if you if your head won't let you have that permission then try and have some people in your life that will make it <laughs> that will argue that it should um i i i was saying to simon earlier i have a thing at work called a well-being action plan 
what that does is that helps my manager to know, look out for my signs. When's Mike doing his stuff again? That might get in the way, might lead to me being less productive, might need time off, etc. Supporting me with that, encouraging me to do the things that keep myself well, really. I think it is that, um, it is that getting to know yourself and that... Um, Speaking as a, you know, I grew up in very much a working class estate in Telford and Shropshire. That kind of thing, I used to think, what hippie nonsense, if I'm entirely honest, but getting to know yourself. But actually, it makes a big difference. If you know yourself, what are you? I think I have to look out for myself is when, I, when, the, when the pile of books next to my bed starts growing and I'm not reading. That's a warning sign. Also, when I stop laughing. When I don't, yeah. when I don't laugh at the joke, that everyday saying, if you didn't laugh, you'd cry, carries huge currency with me. If I'm not laughing at a really good gag, warning sign and, and everybody getting to know what those are for themselves and have some people around you will help you recognize them sometimes if we could everybody doing it their version of that feeling that they've got a right to do that then yeah that that would make a huge change i think thank you so please please ask for help and I, I, you know, I, I can't say this strongly enough. The, uh, I, I, I did this at a, a conference recently and it sort of fell on flat ears because I don't think anyone else liked Harry Potter, but there's a, there's a wonderful Dumbledore saying it was, you know, if any student needs help at Hogwarts, it will be available. And I think that's, that's true of real life. If you, if you ask for support, someone will help. Friends, family, work, it's, it's the most difficult thing for us to do because it's perceived weakness as it always has. But I think, you know, it's just ask for help. And I've always made, you, you can find my phone number on most, uh, most internet searches. I'm very free and easy with it. It's on, it's on lots of websites, such as my email as well. If you haven't got anyone else to turn to, just, just send me a text message, send me an email address. Uh, just, I, I will respond and I will make sure that you get some support because the darkest hours when there's no one else to turn to, it's, it's very difficult for you to think that someone can help, but someone will always help. Thank you. And just, a, I suppose, a related note to that. Uh, if somebody's struggling and they're, they're, they're reaching out for help, I suppose, in the intervening period or, you know, what can I do for myself? What, what would be something I can do to, to help myself improve my mental health? I think let's go back to what we've said all along in terms of those five ways of well-being is, is in order to help yourself, you have to understand yourself and you have to understand that all the thoughts that you're thinking are not necessarily true are not necessarily going to happen and are not necessarily going to come to come to fruition. So it's about that building that mental resilience. And we can only do that when we recognize that we're struggling or when we recognize that we need support in the first place. So again, it's that um, introversion, that look inside yourself. And if you don't feel you can do it on your own, ask for help. If you do feel that you can actually start to build up the resilience, how do you do that? You look at the five ways of well-being. You know, it might be, when we talk about give, it might be volunteering. Um, when we talk about learning something new, it might just be going to a you know, night school and, and learning Excel. It's, it's just about giving yourself a little bit of purpose and a little bit of focus. And I think that's, that's the key thing. If you're doing something that isn't thinking about what's going on or what's impacting you in your life, your mind will move on to the thing that you're doing. So whether that's learning, whether that's exercise, whether that's volunteering, you're taking yourself away from your thoughts and feelings and you're actually doing something else to either help them or you're helping other people. Thank you. Mike? Exactly that. As Simon said it, whilst the, the phrase, this too will pass, this too will change, is, is incredibly true and a, and, a, and a kind of mantra I live my life by in lots of ways. When you're in it, it doesn't feel like it's going to pass. Um, so being active, doing something that can change that mindset to some degree. And baby steps are allowed and they're fine. Um, I think maybe the most successful people, professional people, particularly in workplaces, the, the feeling that I should be a better than this, 
Um, I should be able to do more than baby steps. Um, I'm capable of so much more. Whilst well, so you are capable of that, there, there are times for all of us where we're not capable of our very best. And it's okay to take a step back and reassess that. And yeah, ask for help. Um, sometimes just having that voice of somebody outside of you in your own head that can make a suggestion is. And, and I really like it. It's a kind of, it's a steal from kind of talking therapies and the jargon, cognitive behavioral therapy and in, in NHS medical jargon, really. But the, what would you say to your best mate if they were struggling? How would you advise them? How would you help them? And if it's good advice for them, can you turn it around and apply it to yourself? Um, sometimes our own heads block out our best advice in lots of ways. So I find that one personally very useful. How would I help somebody else? Because I know I would. And if it's good enough for them, then it ought to be good enough for me as well. Mm. well thank you very much. And uh, as we can draw our conversation to a close and uh, how how can people get in touch with mine now obviously your birmingham mind we've already heard of uh, milton Keynes and bedfordshire mind uh how can people get in contact with their local mind um probably the easiest way is is to go to the national mind website i'm literally reading it off a screen is the truth i had an awful short-term memory i can never remember websites and phone numbers is the truth of it so www.mind.org is, is the national website and if you search um localities and services you can go in there it's, it's the usual kind of thing pop up a, a postcode in and it will t- it will zero you in for your, your your local um support i often find myself saying to people um if you if you went to search engine your choice of course and and put in your your locality comma mental health uh, comma help um, and a postcode we'll, you'll find us um, and there are some localities where we don't exist so it's really important that people get help um, there's some wonderful organizations uh, wonderful charities wonderful kind of organizations like simon etc so it's that sometimes it's that more general search of mental health to find a thing that that works for you that may, uh, one quick example of that um, different things really do work for different people so in this city in birmingham there's a local uh, rock metal club um, that set up a charity arm and, and that really came from losing a member of staff to suicide and how much that rocked the mm-hmm. whole establishment and the clientele, uh, clientele etc um, they kind of had an opening night to launch that and we got invited along and I think somebody couldn't turn up so because I've got a mouth I was asked if I'd come and speak um, so I did and I've got tattoos and I like metal as it, as it, as it happens <laughs> um, and what they'd done is they'd found uh, talking therapists um, who have got their battle jackets got their Iron Maiden patches and the Sabbath stuff and everything everything else um, and what young 200 young people showed up and what they were saying was well thank you for being here but the truth is I think I'd feel safe talking to them not you even I've seen your tattoos but even though I'd still prefer to talk to them so it's find that it's finding the thing that you feel safe with and the people you feel safe with and, and sometimes that's work some people would rather talk to somebody at work mm-hmm. than a charity like mind some people would rather talk to something external to work um, the more choices we can offer people something will hit something will work for people Thank you very much. And uh, Mike, Simon, thank you so much for sharing your time and insights with me today. Uh, Absolute pleasure to have you join us on on this pod. And yes, Simon, I think you and I have now got to go jump on a smoothie bike and pedal like hell for 30 seconds, make a smoothie, make some money for... Birmingham Mind. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'd, I'd like to lie and say I'm looking forward to it, but um, I will be a sweaty mess at the end of it, but at least some money will be raised. It's for charity. It's for charity. <laughs> and thank you very much for listening. Uh, we hope you found our conversation valuable. And, you know, again, please subscribe so you never miss another episode. And until the next time, stay safe, stay well, and stay positive. Stay positive.